In this video, I'm going to be reading about the Vana god Frey, the god of the realm Alfheim, realm of the Light Elves, and uh, the brother of the goddess Vanadis, or Freya. And uh, I will be reading, as usually, from my book, The Norseman. That light is reflecting off my book, but see that's the title of the book the name of the author H. A. Gerber uh, let's see there we go here I always mention the name of the book and the author because some people may have not seen my previous videos on the gods and goddesses and uh, I'll be blending a picture in so you can see what Frey looks like right here and that is what uh, Frey looks like. Um, so, let me get started. It is chapter, let's see, chapter 10, no, chapter 9 of page 117 in this book. Okay, chapter 9, Frey. The God of Fairyland. Frey, or Fro, as he was called in Germania, was the son of Njot and Nerthus, or of Njot and Skadi, and was born in Vanaheim. He therefore belonged to the race of the Vanas, the divinities of water and air, but was warmly welcomed in Asgard when he came thither as hostage with his father. As it was customary among the northern nations to bestow some valuable gift upon a child when he cut his first tooth, the Aesir gave the infant Frey the beautiful realm of Alfheim, or Fairyland, the home of the Light Elves. And here I need to actually read something from yet another book concerning the part about Frey, Freya, and the father Njot coming to the Aesir. And it is from this book. The Norse Myths by Kevin Grassley Holland. This is basically a, you know, a simplified recounting of the Eddas because um, not everybody um, prefers reading the English uh, type of writing uh, in the Eddas. This is a simplified version uh, and in my personal opinion more attractive to read but I guess that depends you know um, whether you like that sort of style of uh, English writing in the Eddas as opposed to the simplified version. Um, and this concerns the War of Asgard because, uh, and perhaps I should read right from here. Uh, let's see here. I'm not going to read the whole part, but um, there was a war between the Seer and the Vanir. And when both sides grew weary of that war and wanted to uh, make peace, um, an exchange of uh, deities took place from both the Vanir to the Asir and from the Asir to the Vanir. Um, let's see here. I'll read it from right here. This is from page two of that book uh, called The War of the Asir and the Vanir. Then the gods on both sides grew weary of war. Talk and truth seemed better than such turmoil. So leaders of the Aesir and the Vanir met to discuss terms. They argued about the war's origins and whether the Aesir alone were guilty of causing the war or whether both sides were entitled to tribute. The end of the discussion was that the Aesir and Vanir swore to live side by side in peace and agreed to exchange leaders as proof of their intentions. So two leading Vanir, Njot and his son Frey, made their way to Asgard. Njord's daughter, Freya, journeyed with them, and so did Kvasir, wisest of the Vanir. The Asir welcomed and accepted much as they disliked the fact that Frey and Freya were the children of Njord by his own sister. They appointed Njord and Frey as high priests or high priests to preside over sacrifices, and Freya was consen uh, consecrated a sacrificial priestess. She soon taught the Aesir all the magic that was well known and in common use in Vanaheim. 
For their part, the Aesir sent long-legged Honir and wise Mimir to live in Vanaheim. Honir was well built and handsome, a figure of substance. The Aesir thought he would make an enviable leader in war and peace alike. Mimir, like Vasir, was held to be second to none in his understanding and wisdom. So, basically, that's what happened. It was, um, in a manner of speaking, to basically set in stone this uh, forged alliance and this, you know, formed or signed peace. It is uh, interesting because in our own history, uh, when families, noble families, or even kingdoms warred, um, and they would eventually come to truth and uh, try to set a peace and even form an alliance. Uh, marriages were arranged between two families in order to uh, solidify um, that alliance. And so in the same way, basically, the Asi and Vanir did with the exchange of uh, gods from both the Vanir to the Asir and from the Asir to the Vanir. And now I shall get back to reading from the Norseman. And after only find my page, page 117. And here we go. Here Frey, the god of the golden sunshine and the warm summer showers, took up his abode charmed with the society of the elves and fairies who implicitly obeyed his every order and at the sign from his flitted and fro doing all the good in their power for they were preeminently beneficent spirits. <clears throat> Frey also received from the gods a marvelous sword, an emblem of the sunbeams, which had the power of fighting successfully and of its own accord, as soon as, as, soon as it was drawn from its sheet. Frey wielded his, uh, this principally against the front frost giants, whom he hated almost as much as did Thor. And because he carried this glittering weapon, he has sometimes been conf confounded with a sword god Tyr or Saxnot. The dwarves from Svartalfheim gave Frey the golden bristled boar Gullenbosti, the golden bristled, a personification of the sun. The radiant bristles of this animal were considered symbolical either of the solar rays of the golden grain, which at his bidding waved over the harvest fields of Midgard, or of agriculture, for the boar, by tearing up the ground with his sharp tusk, was supposed to have first taught mankind how to plow. Frey sometimes rode astride of this marvelous boar, whose speed was very great, and at other times harnessed him to his, to his golden chariot, which was said to contain the fruits and flowers which he lavishly scattered about over the face of the earth. Has, hence why Frey's uh, considered a, a fertility god, and in a way a, a god of agriculture. Frey was moreover the proud possessor not only of the dauntless steed Bloduk Hofi, which would dash through fire and water at his command, but also of the magic ship Skit Blatnir, a personification of the clouds. This vessel, sailing over land and sea, was always wafted along by favorable winds and was so elastic that while it could assume large enough proportions to carry the gods, their steeds and all their equipments, it could also be folded up like a napkin and thrust into a pocket. The wooing of Gerda. It is related in one of the lays of the Edda that Frey once ventured to ascend Odin's throne Litskiaf, from which exalted seat his gaze ranged over the white earth. Looking towards the frozen north, he saw a beautiful young maiden enter the house of the frost giant Ingmir, and as he raised her hand to lift, and as she raised her hand to lift the latch, her radiant beauty illuminated sea and sky. A moment later, this lovely creature, whose name was Gerda, and who is considered as a personification of the flashing northern lights, vanished within her father's house. 
and Frey pensively wented his way back to Alfheim, his heart oppressed with longing to make this fair maiden his wife. Being deeply in love, he was melancholy and absent-minded in the extreme, and began to behave so strangely that his father, Njord, became greatly alarmed about his health and bade his favorite servant, Skirnir, discover the cause of this sudden change. After much persuasion, Skirnir finally won from Frey an account of his ascent of Litskiev, and of the fair vision he had seen. He confessed his love and also his utter despair, for his Gerda was the daughter of Gimnir and Angor Boda, in a relative of the murder giant Thiasi, he feared she would never view his suit with favor. Skinnir, however, replied uh, consolingly that he could see no reason why his master should take a despondent view of the case, and he offered to go and woo the maiden in his name, providing Frey would lend him his steed for the journey and give him his glittering sword for a reward. Overjoyed at the prospect of winning the beautiful Gerda, Frey willingly handed Skirnir the flashing sword and gave him permission to use his horse. But he quickly relapsed into the state of reverie which had become usually with him since falling in love and thus he did not notice that Skirnir was still hovering near him nor did he perceive him cunningly steal the reflection of his face from the surface of the brook near which he was seated and imprison it in his uh, drinking horn, which, with intent to pour it out in Gerda's cup and by its beauty win the heart of the giantess for the Lord, for whom he was about to go a-wooing. Provided with this portrait with eleven golden apples and with the magic ring Draubnir, Skirnir now rode off to Jotunheim to fulfill his embassy. As he came near uh, Gimir's dwelling, he heard the loud and persistent howling of his watchdogs, which were personifications of the wintry winds. A shepherd guarding his flock in the vicinity told him, in answer to his inquiry, that it would be impossible to approach the house on account of the flaming barrier which surrounded it. But Skirnir, knowing that Bloduk Hofi would dash through any fire, merely set spurs to his steed and riding up unscathed to the giant's door, was soon ushered into the presence of the lovely Gerda. To induce the fair maiden to lend a favorable ear to his master's proposals, Skirnir showed her the stolen portrait and proffered the golden apples and magic ring which, however, she hardly refused to accept, declaring that her father, Gimnir, had gold enough and to spare. Indignant at her scorn, Skirnir now threatened to decapitate her with his magic sword, but as this did not in the last frighten the maiden, and she calmly defied him, he had recourse to magic arts. Cutting ruins in Cutting ruins in his stick, he told her that, unless she yielded ere the spell was ended, she would be com uh, condemned either to eternal celibacy or to marry some aged frost giant from she could never love, whom she could never love. Terrified into submission by the frightful description of her cheerless future in case she persisted in her refusal, Gerda finally consented to become Freya's, um, become Frey's wife, and dismissed Skirnir, promising to meet her future spouse on the ninth night in the land of Buri, the green grove where she would dispel his sadness and make him happy. If it, maybe for a little bit more light, it would be easier to read, but then it would be too bright here. With that light back there now, anyway. Um, continuing on, don't mind my rambling. Um, Delighted with his success, Skirnir hurried back to Alfheim, where Frey came eagerly to learn the result of his journey. When he learned that Gerda had consented to become his wife, his face grew radiant with joy. But when Skirnir informed him that he would have to wait nine nights ere he could behold his promised bride, 
He turned sadly away, declaring the time would appear interminable. In spite of this lover-like uh, despondency, however, the time of waiting came to an end, and Frey joyfully hastened to the green grove, where, true to her appointment, he found Gerda, and she became his happy wife, and proudly sat upon her throne beside him. <clears throat> According to some mythologists, Gerda is not a personification of the Aurora Borealis, but of the earth which, hard, cold, and unyielding, resists the spring god's prophets of adornment and fruitfulness. The apples and ring defies the flashing sunbeams, Frey sought, and only consents to receive his kiss when it learns that it will else be doomed to perpetual barrenness or given over entirely into the power of the giants, ice and snow. The nine nights of waiting are typical of the nine winter months, at the end of which the earth becomes the bride of the sun, in the grove where the trees are budding forth into leaf and blossom. Frey and Gerda were told, we are told, became the parents of a son called Fjolnir, whose birth consoled Gerda for the loss of a brother, Beli. The latter had attacked Frey and had been slain by him, although the sun god, deprived of his matchless sword, had been obliged to defend himself with a staghorn, which he hastily snatched from the wall of his dwelling. Besides the faithful Skirnir, Frey had other two attendants, a married couple, um, Begvir and Bela, the personifications of mill refuse and manure, which two ingredients being used in agriculture for fertilizing purposes, were therefore considered Frey's faithful servants in spite of their unpleasant qualities. <clears throat> now here it says the historical Frey. Snorro Sturleson in his Heimskringla, or Chronicle of the Ancient Kings of Norway, state that Frey was an historical personage who bore the name of Engvi Frey and ruled in Uppsala after the death of the semi-historical Odin and Njord. Under, the, under his rule, the people enjoyed such prosperity and peace that they declared their king must be a god. They therefore began to invoke him as such, carrying their enthusiastic admiration to such lengths that when he died, the priests, not daring to reveal the fact, laid him in a great mound instead of burying his body, as had been customary until then. They informed the people that Frey, whose name was the northern synonym for master, had gone into the mound, an expression which eventually became the Northmen's phrase for death. Not until three years later did the people, who had continued paying their taxes to the king by pouring gold, silver, and copper coin into the mound through three different openings, discover that Frey was dead. As their peace and prosperity had remained undisturbed, they agreed that his corpse should never be burnt, and they thus inaugurated the custom of mound burial, which in due time supplanted the funeral pyre in man, in man places. One of the three mounds near Gamla Uppsala still bears this god's name. His statues were placed in the great temple there, and his name was du uh, duly, uh, duly mentioned um, in all solemn oaths, of which the usual formula was, So help me, Frey, Njord, and the almighty Asa, Odin. I should also uh, say that, uh, this is not to say that um, the gods were all humans and were deified by our ancestors. There's an old saying, as above, so below, meaning that which is above can reflect also here in Midgard. Um, as, there are, as there is a war in the realm of the gods, so there is a war in the realm of mankind. And um, I know there is a mentioning of a physical, earthly Asgard, uh, supposedly in the uh, Caucasus Mountains that I've read about in other books. That is not to say that this may have been the real Asgard. It just means that, um, as we know of the gods, 
as we honor and pay homage to them, we tend to emulate them. We tend to um, maybe reflect our lives as they do, maybe even embrace their names for ourselves. Um, I mean, just look at it this way. I know plenty of people who have uh, German Shepherds, but they give the, their loyal dogs these German Shepherds, for example, ancient Germanic names, some of which are like Odin, Wotan, Thor, um, Frey, and so forth and so on. That doesn't mean that dog, just because it's named Odin or Wotan, is actually Odin or Wotan. We're, we emulate the gods because we try to... I guess in a sense invoke them within us, embracing their whole being by emulating them, their stories, their names. So this can explain basically why we have, you know, historical figures, you know, who bear the names like the same name of the gods. In any case, to continue on because I still have quite a bit to read here. In my media is at 21 minutes now. Yeah. <clears throat> Worship of Frey. No weapons were admitted in Frey's temples, the most celebrated of which were at uh, Trondheim in Norway, and at uh, Tvera in Iceland. In these temples, oxen or horses were offered in sacrifice to him, a heavy gold ring being dipped in the victim's blood ere the above-mentioned oath was solemnly taken upon it. Frey's statues, like those of all the other northern divinities, were roughly hewn blocks of wood, and the last of these uh, sacred images seem to have been destroyed by Olaf the Saint, who, as we have seen, forcibly converted many of his subjects. Thank you again, filthy Christian faith. Besides, be <clears throat> Besides being the god of sunshine, fruitfulness, peace and prosperity, Frey was considered the patron of horses and horsemen, and the deliverer of all captives. The Yule Feast One month of every year, the Yule month, or Thor's month, was considered sacred to Frey as well as to Thor, and began on the longest night of the year, which bore the name of Mother Night. This month was a time of feasting and rejoicing, for it heralded the return of the sun. The festival was called Yule, Wheel, because the sun was supposed to resemble a wheel rapidly revolving across the sky. My One might as well uh, interpret that as uh, our swastika, our Aryan, our holy Aryan symbol, the swastika. This resemblance gave rise to a singular custom in England, Germany, and along the banks of the Moselle, until within later years, the people were, fought, were, were wont to assemble yearly upon a mountain to set fire to a huge wooden wheel twined with straw, with which all ablaze was to send rolling down the hill to plunge with a hiss into the water. All the northern races considered the Yule Feast the greatest of the year, and were wont to celebrate it with dancing, feasting, and drinking, each god being pledged by name. The first Christian missionaries perceiving the extreme popularity of this feast, thought it best to encourage drinking to the health of the Lord and his twelve apostles when they first began to convert the northern heathens. In honor of Frey, boar's flesh was eaten on this occasion. Crowned with laurel and rosemary, the animal's head was brought into the banqueting hall with much ceremony, a custom long after observed, as the following lines will show. Um, caput apri de ferro, redens laudes domino, the boar's head in hand bring I, which garlands gay and rosemary, I pray you all sing merrily, qui estis in convivio, Queen's College Carol, Oxford. Now, oh, any case. The father of the family laid his hand on the sacred dish, which was called the boar of atonement, swearing he would be faithful to his family and would fulfill all his obligations, an example which was followed by all present, from the highest to the lowest. This dish could be carved only by a man of unblemished reputation and tried courage, for the boar's head was a sacred emblem which was supposed to inspire everyone with fear. 
For that reason, a boar's head was frequently used as ornament for the helmets of northern kings and heroes whose bravery was unquestioned. As, Frey na as Frey's name of Fro is phonetically the same as the word used in German for gladness, he was considered a patron of every joy and was invariably invoked by married couples who wished to live in harmony. Those who succeeded in doing so for a certain length of time were publicly rewarded by the gift of peace of boar's flesh, for which in later times the English and the Viennese, Viennese those from Austria in Vienna, the Viennese substituted a flitch of bacon or ham. Um, at the village of Dunmo in, Ex in Essex, the ancient custom is still observed. In Vienna, the ham or flitch of bacon was hung over the city gate, whence the successful candidate was expected to bring it down after he had satisfied the churches that he lived in peace with his wife, but was not under petticoat rule. It is said that in Vienna, this ham remained for a long time unclaimed until at last a worthy uh, burger presented uh, himself before the churches bearing his wife's written affidavit that they had been married 12 years and had never dis disagreed, a statement which was confirmed by all their neighbors. The churches, satisfied with the proofs laid before them, told the candidates that the prize was his and that he only need climb the ladder placed beneath it and bring it down. Rejoicing at having secured such fine ham, the man speedily mounted the ladder, but as he was about to reach for the prize, he noticed that the ham exposed to the Noonday sun was beginning to melt, and that a drop of fat threatened to fall upon his Sunday coat. Hastily beating a retreat, he pulled off his coat, uh, chocosely remarking that his wife would uh, scold him roundly where he had to stain it. A confession which made the bystanders roar with laughter, and which cost him his ham. Another yuletide custom was the burning of huge log, which had to last through the night. Otherwise, it was considered a very bad omen indeed. The charred remains of this long, very carefully collected and treasured up for the purpose of setting fire to the log of the following year. <clears throat> this festival was so popular in Scandinavia, where it was celebrated in January, that King Olaf, seeing how dear it was to the northern heart, transferred most of its observances to Christmas Day, thereby doing much to reconcile the ignorant people to their change uh, to reconcile the ignorant people to their change of religion. God damn it, I hate Christianity. That's not what it says in here, but that's what I'm stating. As God of peace and prosperity, Frey is supposed to have reappeared upon earth many times and to have ruled the Swedes under the name of Ingvi Frey, whence his descendants were called Inglings. He also governed the Danes under the name of Friedlief, and in Denmark it is said to have married the beautiful maiden Freygerda, whom he had rescued from a dragon. By her he had a son named Frodi, who in due time succeeded him as king. Frodi ruled Denmark in the days when there was peace throughout the world. That is, uh, that is to say, just at the time when uh, Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And because all his subjects lived in amity, he was generally known as Peace Frodi. <clears throat> How the sea became salt. It is related that Frodi once received from Hengi Kip. Hengi Kipater, a pair of magic milestones called Groti, which were so ponderous that none of his servants nor even his strongest warriors could uh, turn them. The king was aware that the mill was enchanted and would grind anything he wished, so he was very anxious indeed to set it to work, and during a visit to Sweden, he saw and purchased the slaves the two giantess Mania and Fenia whose powerful muscles and frames had attracted his attention. On his return home, Peace Frodi led his new servants to the mill and bade them turn the grindstones and grind out gold, peace and prosperity, and they immediately fulfilled his wishes. 
Cheerfully the women worked on hour after hour until the king's coffers were overflowing with gold and prosperity and peace were rife throughout his land. But when Mania and Fenia would fain have rested, <clears throat> but when Mania and Fenia would fain have rested a while, the king, whose greed had been excited, bade them work on. In spite of their entreaties, he forced them to labor hour after hour, allowing them only as much time to rest as was required for the singing of a verse in a song, until exact exasperated by his cruelty, the giant is resolved at length to have revenge. One night, while Frodi slept, they changed the song, and instead of prosperity and peace, they grimly began to grind an, an armed host, whereby they induced the Viking uh, Meisinger to land with a large body of troops. While the spell was working, the Danes continued in slumber, and thus they were completely surprised by the Viking host, who slew them all. Meisinger took the magic millstones Groti and the two slaves and put them on board his vessel, biding the women grind salt, which was a very valuable staple of commerce at the time. The women obeyed, and the milestones were round, went round. The women obeyed, and, the, and their milestones went round, grinding salt in abundance. But the Viking, as cruel as Frodi, would give the poor women no rest, wherefore a heavy punishment overtook him and his followers. Such an immense quantity of salt was grounded by the magic milestones that in the end its weight sunk the ship and all on board. The ponderous stone sank into the sea in the Pentland Firth, or of the northwestern coast of Norway, making a deep round hole in the water, and the waters rushing into the vortex and gurgling into the holes in the center of the stone produced the great whirlpool which is known as the Maelstrom. As for the salt, it soon melted, but was the immense quantity ground by the giantess that it permeated all the waters of the sea, which have ever since been very salty. Wow, 32 minute video, but it was quite um, a few pages on Frey. And as you can see, concerning the Yule Feast, the Yule celebration. Uh, just another holiday stolen by the Christians. Anyways, the video is long enough as it were. Only thing I wanted to say, remember, the gods are greater spirits. They are real. And, um, well, and as I said before, we mortals with our great yet still limited mortal minds cannot expect to truly understand the gods as they are but they are greater spirits they do exist in any case i hope this was interesting to you and informative until next time may the gods be with you may the non guide your path stay safe